I'm Josh Cooperman, host and publisher of Convo by Design, with something brand new for you. A Monday episode of the show called The Design Messengers. I think you're going to like this for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that this is designed to make your design business stronger because together we're going to start thinking differently about the industry and ways to do it better, faster, smarter. Let me remind you, I'm a journalist, not a designer, and I'm certainly not a consultant. I've interviewed some of the very best in the business and have shared techniques, strategies, and ideas that allow you to execute better on your design vision, your design business, or if you're a consumer, of which I hear from many of you who listen to the show, you know this helps you select the right creative for you, your project, interview designers with a keen understanding of what you want, which allows you better to select who is going to be your, your best partner in design. I've said this a few times, and that is one of the main drivers for launching this new brand extension of the podcast. Podcasts are fantastic for learning. They really are. Uh, They're great for entertainment and companionship. You hear me talk about consultants a lot. What do I have against consultants? Nothing at all. I, I think business advice is one of the most valuable things you can do to grow a strong and healthy business. Why would you take the advice of a marketer, a consultant, who really doesn't know the technical side of your industry? Why would you take the advice of a former designer who couldn't make it in the business, but instead decided to create and host a podcast to tell other designers what they couldn't do, uh, or starts a consulting business to share the ins and outs of a business that has dramatically changed since they were in the game? Does this sound mean or insensitive? Uh, Possibly. Uh, It's not intended to be. It's intended to make you think about the information you consume and the purpose it's intended to serve. Let's be clear. Convo by Design is about storytelling. I'm a mirror on the industry with an opinion. I will continue to share my ideas with you, but I don't, one, tell you what to do. I don't tell you what to buy. I don't tell you how to think. I don't tell you who is not getting the job done. I, I don't tell you how great I am or all of the wonderful things I've done to make you believe me. I I don't tell you what to believe, what I share with you. If you do, or if you don't, that's fine. It makes no difference to me. My job as I view it and what I've done for the past 11 years as a journalist, I, as I said, I'm a, I'm a mirror on the industry with an opinion. Uh, I, I have strong opinions and I bring them to you and I share them with you. And that's part of what this is. I will, I will tell you about my experience and share it in context. That context is to position the next story. As a journalist, I'm not here to sell you anything, not products, services, trips, club memberships, subscriptions, nothing except stories, stories about our incredible business researched and crafted to help strengthen our industry. Stories that I hope you find interesting and help you think differently about what it is that you do. I present a a thought and you have a reaction to it. That's, That's what I'm here to do. Why is this important? It's a great question, right? Why is this important? I've told you about my time in in radio broadcasting, <clears throat> but it's been a while. So for those who who don't recall the story, I'll I'll, I'll tell it again here because I think it's relevant. When I first started, it was the early '90s. I was fresh out of college, bright eyes, a curious mind, and wanted desperately to succeed. Shortly after the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was signed into law, this law deregulated cable and radio service made some technical changes with regard to censorship options parents could use on individuals' TVs. But the big thing for me that I did not understand at the time was lifting of the cap on the number of radio stations 
operators could own. I'll go straight to the last page and share the ending. My opinion, it absolutely killed local radio. The radio that was local, special, and truly unique to your city. If, if you look at radio in any of the listenership ratings in major markets, medium markets, or even most small markets, you'll find the same five or six companies own and operate the top stations in each market because they own and operate almost all of the radio stations across the country. Radio was once a vibrant, diverse, and varied group of individual operators who could be creative in their presentation of their music, playlist, personalities in each day part, and the amount of time DJs could talk between songs. When I was growing up in Southern California, it was, it was KLOS versus KMET and KNAC, and then K-Rock joined the party, and by the early 1980s, I think... I remember growing up with local music and, and rock music in Southern California crafted and guided and informed the way that I thought and the way that I acted. And I, I absolutely loved radio growing up. It's why I wanted to be in radio professionally. But that's not the case today. And if you would like to know why, you can draw a line to the Telecom Act of 1996. I think it stifled creativity in a meaningful way, limited the type of new music we're exposed to, and irrevocably changed the future of music by making way for Napster, Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, amongst, amongst a host of others, which is why we use media differently these days and why radio is what it is. How many of you actually listen to over-the-air radio now? Depending on your generation, it, it drops precipitously. Industries change based on business climate and appetite for what they have to offer. By the way, there is, there is a message here that draws directly back to the design industry. And I want to set the story up so that it makes sense. The design industry has lost a number of incredible titles over the past year plus and it's not just here in the US. This is not just a design industry issue. Every category of print is suffering. And as both a journalist and lover of design, that saddens me. The pressures on the industry have been caused by a number of factors that includes the cost of paper, printing, paying good writers, and the proliferation of digital options. And the outlook for print is not improving with the latest in AI, ease of digital content creation, and the subscription squeeze. What do I mean, the subscription squeeze? So if, if your budget is X and your expenditures are Y, Z is the remainder between the two. With inflation, with the number of new subscriptions you have, the number of, of options available to you, the ability to spend money with other companies has been minimized. So you're making more choices now than you did before. Maybe instead of your favorite six magazines, with the time you have to read them, maybe you're only reading three. So what happens to those other three? Anyway, the purpose of the Design Messengers and this series is to keep you abreast of new developments, the latest media and business ideas. Yes, I am a mirror on the industry, but I also have a take, and I plan on sharing this take with you measured against facts, opinion, and results. Would you really want a former stockbroker telling you what your clients want and how you should specify your work as a designer? I wouldn't. So if you want to know how to better keep your books as a designer, Find great content hosted by an accountant. There are many truly amazing podcasts hosted by lawyers about contracts. Hiring managers share the best practices about hiring and recruiting. With only so many hours in the day, why prioritize the free time you, you do have and make that information count? Please understand, there is also a number of wonderful shows hosted by actual working designers sharing their strategies and stories with you. And that's amazing. Those are the shows that should be in your queue 
not a former designer or a consultant telling you without, you know, real information what you should be doing because that's how they sell their services. This is also a living behind the scenes, breathing idea that has changed in real time because that is the new reality. Over the years, I've shared business ideas with you, not the blocking and tackling of your day, but what is happening in the world of creative business and what others are doing, perhaps in other industries, that you might be able to use to execute better on your day-to-day. Mondays on the Design Messenger series, episodes of Convo by Design, you will find actionable ways to start your week, perhaps thinking a bit differently about this vibrant and diverse industry of ours. Perhaps we will be talking more about AI stock market financials of some of the biggest companies in the design space. Why would we do that? Because you can learn a great deal about what the clients are spending on by the performance of the companies that make the product. The Design Messengers episodes will also be sharing trending ideas in the business that allow you to know what's coming well before they become the trends. In the, in the trade pubs, uh, <laughs> that the trade pubs will tell you, and they're not the only ones, by the way, that are the next must-haves or must-avoids. We're going to get to that in a little bit, too. Have you ever heard of evolutionary adaptation? Evolutionary adaptation is what organisms do by way of adapting to the changing circumstances of their environment to improve their chances of survival. In the wild, the attached article, and you can, you can get to this through the show notes, demonstrates how birds' eyes are getting smaller to account for light pollution. Have you noticed that most schools have perimeter fences where there were none five, ten years ago? We all know why that's happening, but we rarely think about it. This is not about a color for the year, but an adaptive change that designers, architects, landscape architects can use to do more, better business. On the show, we've been talking about the multi-kitchen household. Conventional design thought had one kitchen in the home and some form of exposed fire for cooking outdoors. And I'm, and I'm talking modern era right? Look at what the the industry has done with the outdoor kitchen, working kitchens, butler's pantries, and sculleries. Many a landscape architect are now experts in the outdoor culinary pavilion. That should be the domain of the interior designer. Not that it has to be, but as an interior designer, if you do the interior kitchen, why not add the exterior kitchen to your plan, grow your revenues with the same client. That's a business extension given away because it happens to reside on the other side of the threshold. If you could add an $80,000 plus room to every project you design, would you? You can listen back to some episodes where I share the story of the record companies versus radio and radio versus Apple. Same exact thing, but it happened in the 1990s. As Mark Twain said, history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. We will certainly be exploring more of these ideas because they're out there. And if you just pay attention to them, instead of that endless scroll that runs on Instagram, I have nothing against Instagram or social media. I think it's misapplied in many cases, but I also think taking a few minutes from that to focus on some ways that you could actively make more money for your business right now without spending additional time to do it, that that can't be bad. So think differently about what you say. In November of 2023, I produced the programming lounge at the West Edge Design Fair, as I have for many 
of the eight editions of the show. And by the way, if you want to hear those, those episodes and what those panels sounded like, you can listen to West Edge Wednesdays uh, through the first quarter of 2024 and hear 10 amazing programs by numerous, numerous creatives. In preparation for casting and while ideating new and different programming concepts, I did a great deal of research. And if you're a designer architect, showroom owner, manufacturer, or anyone else that I would consider for the programming stage, it's an interview for which you or many don't even know they're being interviewed. And, and I'm not alone in this. As a journalist, every contributing editor, every contributor, every editor, every publisher should be looking at the social media of those with whom they might want to work. I've been watching the social media feeds for of many creatives for quite some time. And I think it warrants mentioning that your social media feed might be costing you opportunities. It doesn't matter what you think about wars around the world. When you take a side, you are offending those who believe the other side of the conflict. Full stop. It is what it is. This not only affects the usual third rails like politics and religion, but everything. Check the show notes for a link to the false consensus effect. This is the idea that individuals are predisposed to the idea that their own beliefs and thoughts are correct. It's a cognitive bias, and it's the idea that others believe what they believe, whether it's true or not. So when you come out with those posts that are inflammatory to one side of a story, and and look, let's be honest, it's a story of which many, if not most, really don't understand what they're talking about because there's so much that goes into it. And and you you can pick the ones that are in the news or on the news every single night. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, you, you very well might be costing yourself, your firm, your brand, by posting the non-endemic commentary. By endemic, I refer to your company goals, ideals, and values. You know, you will rarely see in the about section of any website what a firm or individual's values or morals happen to be. Many I've spoken with say that they limit what they share in their about, to be vague as not to offend or limit who might be interested in what they do, potential clients, editors, etc. Yet their social profiles scream about things that they would never discuss the way that they do were they on a programming stage in front of a live and engaged audience. Now, before you email me and say, well, I would and I do, I I get it. There are those who feel strongly about what they do and they consider it living authentically to say what's on their mind at all the time, all the time. But I will tell you, there are reasons, well-documented reasons not to do this. I'll tell you that as a programmer, I will not cast someone who has the tendency to veer off course and potentially derail a focused conversation. Why? Because if you're a designer, and you come to an event that has been programmed for you, and you have taken the time, you bought a ticket, you brave the traffic, you come out and do it, and then you sit there, and you're, you're being delivered something that you had no idea, that you didn't sign up for. You're now wondering, why did I waste my time to come here and do this when it didn't match my expectations? Anyway... Um, I completely lost track of where I was going, but I will tell you, oh, I know what I was going to say. So there is a showroom owner I follow on social media. I don't follow this individual because I like their commentary. I, I do like much of what their company produces. And no, I will not be sharing the name of this individual here. Uh, I'm not looking to dox anybody. I will use them as an adverse example. A what not to do sample, if you will, when speaking in person with creatives to demonstrate this idea and this particular showroom owner is, is the perfect example of what not to do. Why? 
Well, first, they live for lists. We have spoken about lists before and why I dislike them as much as I do. They use big name designers in these lists in the hopes of getting said designers <clears throat> to repost. It's marketing, yes, but it's pedestrian and it's purely clickbait. They're only doing this because they want those designers to put it on their feeds. And by the way, most, most designers, when they see themselves posted somewhere, will share it. You might want to read it and check the background of the people that you're post reposting before you share it. Maybe it's not, it's not as important to you as you think it might be. Anyway. This individual also takes shots at other showrooms, which is just ast astounding to me. Personally and professionally, I will tell you this is a terrible idea for a litany of reasons, not the least of which is that it just makes you a jerk in the eyes of those specifiers who use that brand's product in their work and in their design. If you were to stand in front of a group and simply trash brands because you don't like them, the odds are not in your favor that you would exit that environment with a positive outcome. And while vague, that can mean a number of things like diminished reputation, loss of sales, or influence with the design community, or worst case scenario, someone in the audience has their smartphone and they're recording this and they decide to share it with a, with a large audience and it goes viral. Free speech, you say. We all know that free speech has consequences. You can say it, but then you have to live with the consequences. Life is hard enough as it is. Don't go out of your way to make it more difficult. I, I read an article, again, you can find this in the show notes, called Why the Past 10 Years of American Life Have Been Uniquely Stupid by Jonathan Haidt. It was from the May 2022 issue of The Atlantic. Haidt makes reference to the Tower of Babel. It's a great read, and it makes some interesting points about how our ideas, language, and deployment of our ideas has become an incomprehensible mess. Thinking differently about your words and context is vital to not just your success, but the success of our industry. I've mentioned my days in radio, and that is the perfect industry to use as one that had it all. For decades, radio enjoyed a monopolistic rarity. Still does for those companies that own radio frequencies on the AM and FM bands. Same for TV, as a matter of fact, but they took this for granted. They lacked, they lacked vision and imagination, and now they do not enjoy that same exclusivity because you can watch, listen, and publish anytime, anywhere on so many different platforms. They, can all, they cannot all be mentioned here, same story for the record labels and General Motors, which could have had the absolute exclusive on electric vehicles for decades with the EV1 and what that might have meant to Tesla or Rivian or Fisker or the Prius, for, for, for that matter. Do you think if they knew then what they know now, they might have done things differently? This is the Design Messengers. It's an audio essay crafted to get your week off to a great start by sharing ideas to launch you into being the best you can be in all your endeavors, but specifically as a creative in the design and architecture space. Thank you for listening. If you are not already a subscriber, please consider subscribing to the show so you receive every episode of the Design Messengers and Convo by Design automatically when they're published. If you are listening to us for the first time, welcome. You can find Convo by Design everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. And uh, if you are so inclined, please also consider following on Instagram at Convo by Design with an X. Be well and take today first. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.